from the education bureaucracy and from the health technocracy. And so on and so forth, a hundred <coughs> times replicated. And replicated a hundred times over. Naturally, administrative expenses will be huge. But what is even worse is that when the money reaches the grassroots, it cannot be coordinated. For example, under the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, which boasts that a hundred days of employment will be provided to every household that is in need of work. A hundred days of employment will be provided to every household that is in need of work. And if work is demanded and not given, then a toll will be provided equivalent to the wages lost. The actual situation in the ground is in that in the poorest states of India, which can generally be defined as this this Ganga area, in the poorest states of India, it is between 6 and 10 percent of households that have received 100 days of employment. And when it comes to the payment of the dole, the staggering figure is that one person received it in, in Kerala over the last four years. And the highest number to receive it is 1,500 persons in the state of Jharkhand. It's not working. And why is it not working? Because they say, what will we do? Lifting mud, because that's all that's allowed under Manrega. But if you were to coordinate Manrega with the Sarva Siksha Abhyan, then all this labor can be employed on building the primary school. The labor component would then be free. But because the district education officer will under no circumstances <coughs> see the officer who is in charge of, uh, of the Rural Employment Guarantee Program, there's no coordination. And who suffers? Not the bureaucrats, he's each got their own people. It's the people who suffer who end up getting maybe 10, maybe 15, maybe 20 pairs in the to which they are entitled. We can only change this if the recommendatory portions of the parts 9 and 9A are made virtually obligatory, if not mandatory. Now, this question was raised back in 1988-89, when as a civil servant I was working <coughs> on the draft list. And I was assured by two very famous legal luminaries, perhaps they're both still with us, although I'm not in touch. One was the law secretary, and the other was, uh, and they called the legal secretary or something. One was Sri P.C. Rao, and the other was Srimati Ramadevi, and I think all of you would know her. That in the context of the constitutional amendment, may amounted to sham. But that may have to be put in instead of shall, because Panchayati Raj is a state subject. And since we were doing this legislation in the shadow of the Sakarya Committee report on Central State Relations, which had come out in 1987, it was essential that we don't convert the question of the empowerment of the local bodies into a center state issue. And so respecting the structure of the Constitution, which had, in a less enlightened time, decreed that Pachayati Raj was exclusively a state subject, the center prepared a major constitutional amendment. Indeed, it is the longest and most detailed amendment in the constitution to say that there shall be Pachayati Raj, but leaving it to the state to pour the water into the land. In actual practice, the experience has been extremely varied. We have at one end of the spectrum the state of Kerala, where 40% of development funds are planned and implemented by the local governments. And unsurprisingly, the highest HDI ranking in India is that of Kerala. And we have other states that have also tried to do something in this regard. Generally, they are the ones on the periphery of India, which is generally the more prosperous part of India, 
and generally where HDI rankings are high. States like Tamil Nadu, like Karnataka, Goa, to some extent and in some areas, Andhra Pradesh, although I regard his record as being extremely mixed. In Maharashtra and Gujarat, where there have been long-standing and continuous systems of local self-government, which predate the constitutional amendments. But in the heart of India, apart from Rajasthan, where some improvement has recently <laughs> taken place, and Haryana, where again, recently some improvement has taken place, the situation with respect to Panchayati Raj is not at all, is non-existent in Delhi, and is uh, most unsatisfactory in Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, in Orissa, in Chhattisgarh, in Harkhand, in the places where this is most required. And the consequence is that while one India soars at 9% growth, when America is staggering along at 1 or 2%, and therefore we become the flavor of the month at Devos, and the Tatars and the Albanis are fetid as being the engines of growth in this country. At the other end of the spectrum, 47% of our children under 5 are from severely to moderately malnourished. 9 out of 10 pregnant Indian women suffers from anemia. We have more hungry millions added to our population every year than the rest of the world put together. We are, yes, the world's second fastest growing large non-oil economy, with only China ahead of it, and likely to be beaten on the GDP network in a matter of five or ten years. And on the other hand, the Oxford Initiative on Multidimensional Poverty shows us that eight of the most populous states of India have much worse human development indicators than any state of sub-Saharan Africa. We are a country where the froth is phenomenally rich and the milk is phenomenally curved. Now this cannot be rectified except and only by effective local government. Why? For the reason given by Mahatma Gandhi, included in the paper that Mr. Kiyar Munia, my batchmate, has circulated, and uh, which he didn't read out to, and so I'm going to read out just one line. Gandhiji said that it has to be Swarajya of the poor and that everybody should get sufficient work to meet one's necessities. He then said this idea can be achieved only when the means of production to meet the primary needs of life are under the control of the people. True Swaraj cannot be achieved there in the constitution. But that same constitution by distinguishing between the mandatory and the recommendatory provisions has thus far in effect suborned the aims and objectives of the legislation. In view of the Supreme Court having said that the aims and objectives of any piece of legislation as stated to Parliament should be taken into account by interpreting the implementation of those provisions of the legislation. I think there's a major, major responsibility of jurists to advance the jurisprudence in this regard. As the minister in Delhi, I couldn't take state governments to court. It would have caused an enormous constitution. But as individuals and enlightened individuals, jurists are therefore experts in your particular sphere of work. I do believe that Mr. Adi Shagarwal could make a lasting contribution to what has been the most important uh, tier of our democracy and of our development by setting up a group of you to see how we can push the frontiers of our jurisprudence. How to quote Mr. Peck in the United States of America, common law can be used to 
give more content to constitutional law. How can we do that in India to give the people of India a fair deal? For if we don't, then what is already happening in one third of the districts of India, an armed revolt against democracy on the grounds that development is not desirable, it is only disruptive, could spread. We in urban India, and especially in the middle class economics of our society, are unaware of this because this rebellion is not lapping at our doorstep. But unless we act today, I am not sure that we can either guarantee our democracy or our development. But we can if we empower our people to <coughs> their own entitlements, as the middle class have done after the abolition of feudalism following independence. We have to replicate this. Otherwise, since I'm 70, I might escape the revolution, but I'm not sure my children will. मसरत के झूलों में झूलो सदा और प्यार के गीत भी गुनगुनाते 